Hi, this is Mickey Fe here with Mentor Shift, and today's guest is Ijaz Khan, who is an Indian-born wildlife photographer and filmmaker. He's got an amazing life story as an immigrant, came to the United States and um, kind of realized his dreams in fashion and then in photography. His life took several unexpected turns and in this interview I'm helping him to kind of dissect what was the mindset, what was the mental attitude that has allowed him to become who he is today. He's a helper, he is on a mission to help and slow down the climate change in the world and he's on a mission to show the beauty of animals in all walks in many interesting places in the world. So stay tuned, stay with us, and we'll dive in in a moment. Ijaz, welcome to Mentorship. It's great to have you here today. Oh, it's an honor. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Mickey. You know, uh, when I'm preparing for a, a conversation like this, it's, it's always very interesting because I do have people... I'm lucky to have great people and interesting people, but when there is something in common, you know, it's kind of extra exciting in, in a way. And I do feel like we have something in common. You know, we talked about uh, Hamilton, the musical and how they are singing immigrants get the job done. And, you know, it's, we, we are both uh, kind of coming from an immigrant background and, and I know you were born in India. So I, I actually wanted to start right there at the beginning um, you were born in India and, 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 you know, what sort of environment that was and how did the idea came that you will go somewhere else? Um, well, we, yeah, I mean, I was born in uh, Bombay. It used to be called Bombay and now it's called Mumbai, but I refuse to call it Mumbai. I'm going to call it Bombay. So I was born in Bombay, India. And, um, my father, uh, a film director. Uh, and a film producer. So I've been through uh, his sets. I've gone through his sets. I've seen what he did and what he didn't do and so on and so forth. You know, never in the interest of learning anything. I was just there because I was forced to be there, kind of. Um, right. No babysitting. Come on, let's go to the set. You know, something like that. Okay. Um, so so I, I saw that the environment there was, dad was a very uh, um, successful director, producer. Uh, and then later on to to lose everything, uh, everything that he earned and everything that he had uh, down to the penny. I mean, literally, we have seen uh, things in my household where he had the best cars and the best houses and the best everything. And then to reach a point where we didn't have money to eat in the house. Hmm. So, you know, the early part of my life, I was... Uh, so to speak, the king, kind of, because we had everything. And then the latter part of my life in India, uh, dad had lost absolutely everything where we didn't have money to pay the rent or we didn't have money to eat. So that was the thinking and that was the process of, okay, I got to do something with my life. I have to get away from here. Um, I didn't. Uh, I didn't think of photography or filmmaking. Actually, I didn't want to do filmmaking uh, because I saw what happened with my father. Right. And um, you know, at a very early age, I decided I'm going to leave India and, uh, and go somewhere. The options were London, uh, Australia, or the United States. And the United States was the only place where I could stand on my own two feet without being dependent on someone. Um, in other words, I didn't have to get married to someone or I didn't have to go through a, uh, you know, certain amount of years. Australia doesn't give it to you until you go through certain amount of years. So it was just the United States. So I said, okay, let's, uh, buy a one way ticket to, uh, to the, to New York. Wow. Yeah. Did you, by the way, have any visibility? I'm, I'm curious as a, as a kid. Um, how, how old were you then when, when you made that one-way trip? Um, I came here, I, it, I was about 20, 
24, 25. Right, right. So, so you were a young adult already, and I, I'm, I'm sure you had some kind of view on why your why, why it happened to your father, what 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 happened to him in terms of losing the business. So, did you have a, a like a clear theory of what do you want to do differently? Or what was it kind of obscure? Oh, I, I just didn't want to be in this industry. Uh, I had uh, not in the photography business, not in the, not in the filmmaking. So I, I just went towards clothing. Right. Um, so I came here and I got into the clothing business. I was working for a store earlier on in my life in back home as well in a clothing business. Right. right. So I, I um, you know, I continued working here. As soon as I came to America, one thing led to another, to another, to another. And within a few years, the American dream was fulfilled, so to speak. You know, uh, an immigrant is here. He's working. Um, you know, I bought my first house a few years after I reached America. And everything was like just absolutely fine. And the clothing business was amazing. And so you knew um, some people, did you have relatives here or did you kind of start from complete scratch when you came? I, I came to America and um, I, at the airport, I was wondering what to do. No, I don't have any relatives, no, no uncle, aunt, brother, sister, cousin, none of that. So right. from JFK, I got into a yellow cab and I asked the guy, I said, um, I want to go to the place where they have the tall buildings. I didn't know the, the name Manhattan. <laughs> So he takes me to Manhattan and he says, where do you want to go? And I said, well, I don't know where I can go, but I have $300 in my pocket. Take me to a hotel that I, I'm going to live here for some time. And he stopped the car, his taxi, he turned around, he looked at me, he said, $300 is not going to go too far. So he takes me to 44th Street, I believe it was 44th or 43rd uh, on 11th Avenue. It was a halfway house, so to speak. Right. Um, so I went there and, you know, I was, I thought it was, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I thought, okay, great. I'm going to make it here. So no matter what I was going to do, it was going to, you know, take me to a better place. So I get into my room for the first time. She gives it to me. It was, I believe she said $11 or $15 per night. And, but I had to share the room with someone else. <clears throat> I, I didn't know that there are such things as people who were doing drugs. They used to live over there. Uh, prostitution used to happen in that place. Yeah. So I said, great, if I have to share the room, I'll share the room. Um, I went in, put my bag. And those days I used to, I'm ashamed to say it, but those days I used to smoke. So I took my pack of Marlboros and I put it on, on the table and the bathroom was not in the room. It was uh, in you know common bathroom. So I walked out. When I came back, the pack of cigarettes were gone. And this guy who was in the room, um, I looked at him. I said, did you take my pack of cigarettes? And he says, no, I didn't. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I left them here. He's like, no, nope, you didn't. And he started getting mad at me. I soon realized that, you know, I'm not in the best place. And um, I started, so the next thing I had to do was to go find myself a job. And the next day I walked into every single store going uptown, asking for a job. No one gave me a job. On the second day, I walked downtown, walking into every single store. I didn't get a job. And then on the third day, I walked to... Um, Broadway, 27th Street and Broadway. And all of a sudden, I see tons of Indians. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm home. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. I, I felt safe. I felt like I, you know, I saw someone like me. Uh, bottom line, I walked into a store and, you know, one thing led to another. I found someone who knew me from back home and they gave me the job. So that's that was my first job uh, in the United States. And. And then, you know, then it's the normal thing what immigrants have to do to to cope up and to um, to learn the things that we that we don't know when coming to the United States. You know, one of the things that I still laugh about is uh, I think it was my second or my third day that I walked into a, a deli 
And I saw everybody offering, ordering coffee. So I said, okay, I'm going to take an odd coffee as well. So I gave the coffee. Uh, I mean, I ordered the coffee. She gave it, gives it to me. And then I saw everyone taking the little red stirrers and stirring the coffee or taking it and then leaving. And I thought, oh my God, in America, they drink their coffee with these red stirrers. <laughs> and I, you know, I learned something. For me, it was like, oh my God, you learned something new. So I came outside and I started sipping through that stirrer later on to find out that, you know, I was doing it wrong. So yeah, you know, you, I have many such stories. You, know, you learn when you come here. Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering if, if you kind of look back because you make it sound easy. You know, you came here with nothing, walk down in the streets, walk up the streets, finally <laughs> got a job, bang, a few years later, you bought your first house. So No, 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 that, that wasn't the case. My first job actually lasted for 11 days. 11 days. Uh, yeah. Because uh, the owner of the store... Um, you know, for some reason I have, I have this really bad, uh, thought process of Indians in America that have been in America have a tendency to exploit the new Indians that come in. And, uh, anyway, this gentleman, I was working for him and then on the 11th day, he spoke down to me and I'm like, I'm not standing for this. And he said, if you're not standing for this, you don't have a job anymore. And he, he let me go. So after that, you know, the normal things of uh, of an immigrant, you drive a taxi, you work at a bodega, you wash vegetables. I have worked in a factory cleaning, cleaning, you know, cutting the threads from the inside. Um, I have lived on Almond Joy for uh, approximately six months. You know, the, the candy, Almond Joy, so I used to, I didn't have the money to eat because whatever money I had was going towards rent. And I met a few people at this first job where they said to me, if you want to come stay with us, come stay with us, but you'll have to pay rent. And I went and I stayed with them in Staten Island. And it was like nine guys in one small <laughs> little place. Yeah. Um, you know, but you had to pay rent. So you worked and then you paid your rent and whatever was left over, you had to save to eat so i was on arm and joy literally for six to eight months until i could put some money together and and go get myself you know legal legalized so to speak uh once that happened then is when i started to get the real job but before that it was just like everybody else you know you you pay your dues and yeah. uh that comes in shape different shapes and forms so you know you do what you have to do and what was the leap? Because it sounds like you know it started pretty much like a lot of the stories start, as as you just described. And I understand you got legal, and then you know things get easier. But what, was there a period of time, or was there a point in time when you figured out, oh, here is what I want to do. Here is here is what's going to get me to the next level. Or was it a just a complete, you know, lock of circumstances? How, how do you remember that? Uh, no, I think the next level was, uh, I was already at my next level in the clothing business. Um, <laughs> knock on wood, it, it was doing really, really well. And, uh, you know, it was the typical American dream. I had my picket fence and, and everything was just absolutely, uh, amazing. I had no intentions of leaving. I did always fool around with cameras just because. I grew up with them. So I always, you know, had a camera. Uh, matter of fact, my uh, my first camera in America was given to me by my wife as an engagement gift. Uh, so she saw how, how crazy I was about taking pictures and so on. So she presented that to me when I gave her the ring. Um, so I played with it, never with the intention of becoming a photographer because clothing was doing fine. And and clothing, um, when you say clothing, that that was selling clothes, or did you have your own brand? Or uh, we had a brand called Tangerine NYC, um, and uh, we were selling silk uh, silk blouses, dresses, and so on. So uh, yeah, I mean, you know, that was doing amazingly well, but it came with a huge price. The price was that you had to live it twenty four seven. 
Um, and I didn't know that all the businesses had to do the same thing. I was just under the impression that the clothing business is the only business. It was the worst business while I was in it. Um, mm -hmm. But that that was that's wrong. That's uh, not true. So yeah, I had um, the reason why I switched over from clothing to photography. We had a tragedy in our life, um, my wife and I, and. Once that happened, I I just could not go back to, I still am not back to the same person as I used to be. And, um, mm. you know, that, that actually made me question why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, you know, it, it was a death of my daughter and that didn't, I didn't do well with it. I mean, you know, I don't think anyone can do well with it. So that that was a struggling period for me and my family for over three, four years. And that basically took the life out of me. Um, and after that was, uh, it had passed, my thought was, I live once <laughs> and I am not going to uh, do something that I don't love. Um and and you know that what what did I love at that point other than the fact that oh I'm I've come to America I've become legal I'm making money and I wasn't thinking what I loved and what I didn't love I, you know life was just going on and thank God it was going on in the right direction uh, financially at least yeah so um, when I started to question that all of a sudden the cameras and the filming and all of that came back to me and that gave me the most amount of pleasure. And, uh, you know, with the agreement and the, and the support of my wife and my two boys, uh, because everybody suffered once I decided that, you know, the money changed totally because now I was starting my new career at, a later stage now i have kids and you know dad's going to attempt something different in life but the more i thought about it the more i said to myself um you know just like my daughter is gone i'll go one day do i want to go unhappy do i want to go not doing what i really love doing and um you know i stuck to photography i um I am blessed and I'm, you know, I thank God every day that my family was total, sub, totally supportive of what I'm doing. Yeah, it's interesting. I I shared with you a little bit that I work as a coach. Um, that's that's probably the biggest part of my work when I work with individuals and teams. And one of the things that we do is, and I do in in, in this method is that you know, let's start with what are you passionate about? Let's start with what you love doing in life. And it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. I didn't know about this, that, you know, often people ask this question only when something like a tragedy happens, because that, that makes you question everything that was sort of assumed. To exactly. Be, or, yeah. And, and I was curious, like when you started this, you knew that you loved it, right? Like you were interested in it and you loved it and you had a camera. Did you also know that you're very good at it? Or did that come? Uh, I, I, think, I think the very good part is for the people to decide, uh, not me. I just know that I, when I look at an image and I, it puts a smile on me, I like it. And that's what I put out for the people and hopefully they like it too. Um, but... You know, it's the matter of making mistakes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think everything in life is all about making mistakes. So the more mistakes you make, the better you get at it. Right. And, uh, you know, I've learned from making the expensive mistakes because these days we have digital. Uh, in those days when I was making mistakes, I was doing it on film. <laughs> and film, film mistakes are very, very expensive. So... Uh, you know, you 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 write down everything. You learn not to make the same mistake again. And I think that's what helps now in digital because uh, I was given one role. One role had, you know, uh, 10 to 12, if you're doing medium format uh, frames in it. If you had the wrong exposure, you had the wrong exposure. Your money is lost. Yeah. So uh, trying to get that perfect 
helped me. And we, I didn't want to get it perfect because I, I mean, of course, I want to get it perfect because I want to see it perfect. But I was also afraid that I wouldn't be able to buy the next role and make it better. Got it. So, yeah, you know, makes sense. I, I'm wondering, you know, when you started, okay, you you were kind of like, okay, I love this. I'm gonna just do this because life is short. Let's do what I love, and let you know, let people be the judge of uh, my work. Did you have some sense of a purpose that like, oh, here is the higher purpose of me starting photography? Or was it just like, you know, any any kind of photography at the beginning? How did you figure out your niche? Because um, by now you have a niche. Well, I started off in fashion, of course. I was in the clothing business. Uh -huh. I knew the buyers. I wanted to do fashion. So might as well start with that. Um, I tried doing the editorials, but I kept getting the small, uh, dirty jobs of catalogs and so on and so forth. And I hated those. So the only way to go around that was to be able to do bigger magazines, do some editorials. Do So that basically shaped my thinking. And I, I dissected it a little bit more. Do I like commercial photography? No, but it feeds my 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 kids, my family. Uh, do I love editorial? Absolutely, do it. Still at this point, you know, fashion editorials make me crazy. So, um, and then you just balance in between the two of them of what you want to do and what you don't want to do, and and you go from there. Um, what you don't want to do normally feeds you. Right. What you. <laughs> <laughs> what you what you want to do is your passion, and then you just need to come up with a way that's a healthy balance between the two of them. Right. So that yeah, that that makes sense. That was a safe angle. You knew that industry. You had connections. You started there, and then even within that, there were jobs that you preferred, others that you didn't like, but they they paid for you, um, and and for your living and the family, and then. So how did you get to um, the idea that you should be photographing not people, but maybe animals and nature? How did that come? Um, so actually what happened was while I was doing my fashion work, I had no intention of photographing animals or horses or or any of that. I um, I had a friend who was looking to change her career from a model to to an actress. And uh, she was, I believe, 25 years old, and she was getting very worried that, you know, now she's old. And in the fashion industry, 25-year-old, those days used to be as good as uh, 90 years old, right? So she said, what am I going to do? And she's crying, and she's going nuts about that. So I said, you know, what do you want to do? She's like, I want to be an actress. So... I went and we made a film. Um, it wasn't, I had absolutely no interest in making the film. Uh, at one point, she even asked me, do you know how to make films? And I'm like, I don't, but I'll, you know, if I'm going to help you, let's make a film. Mm -hmm. And uh, after I directed that film, uh, it was a short film. Uh, I believe it was 18 minutes long. Uh, it landed up at Cannes Film Festival for Best Director. Uh, so, you know, that made me feel like, oh my God, I'm better than Steven Spielberg. Huh. So I, I, you know, so when I came back from there, um, I started another film and that film, the budget was so high and I really thought I was so good that I invested a lot in that. And that film didn't do well at all. Actually, it didn't even complete. Uh, I, I couldn't even finish completing. And at that point, I just totally got depressed. And I'm like, okay, to hell with this film. What am I going to do in life? And, and I went from my clothing business to the photography business. And then I tried doing films. That didn't work out. I've used up all the money from my family and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, I just killed myself. And then my wife said to me, why don't you just uh, calm down, go away, do something that you want to do. And when you come back, we'll think about what you should do and how you can go ahead with uh, creating some sort of money for the family. So I actually ran away to Alaska. Mm -hmm. And when I went to Alaska, I started to photograph nature. 
Um, and one thing led to another and I came back after that trip and I told my wife, okay, I'm going on another one. And she like, okay, great. And then I went to another one. And then from there I came back and I said, okay, now I'm going to France to photograph horses. And from, <laughs> so it went back and forth and back and forth. And while I'm coming back and creating these photographs, it was in a business. I didn't think I was going to make it into a business. People started to make comments on that. Uh, I had it on my fashion photography website and people started to say, oh, can we buy this? And can we buy that? And can we buy that? And then all of a sudden it turned into like, okay, if, if I can monetize on this, then it's, it's, I can sell it. So that becomes a business. And actually that's how wildlife started. Wildlife started hmm. not because I had intentions to start wildlife. Wildlife started because I went to Alaska and I just uh, fell in love with nature. I mean, I had never seen nature before. I didn't know anything about animals, horses, or what you, you know, whatever. And um, yeah, so then I started photographing. And then I'm a black or white person. I'm, you know, an extremist. So I took it to another level and I went up to the North Pole and uh, I've done that. And then I went all the way down to the South Pole. So I've done that too. So, you know, it just became an obsession of getting better at it. Right. Very interesting. So so it's almost like things are happening by chance. You know, you, you, you go <laughs> do your thing and then something finds you. Is, th is that what it is? Or is there some kind of a deeper intention there if you look back yeah, uh, all, kind of... all all i can say is, is for me the intention in the wildlife side of things is i am privileged uh to you know god has given me the gift of going to such places and capturing such images and i think it becomes a responsibility to bring it back and show it to people that cannot see it for themselves. So that is the intention. I mean, my intention in wildlife photography is just um, bring back something that someone can see and say, I would have never seen this if it wasn't for him. Mm. And and you're happy if that happens? Or do you want them to kind of go on a, a little trip from there too? Like, so is it enough for me to see your photos and go, Wow, you know, I'll never get to the south of France and see these horses. Amazing, or or is there is there something else? Just curious. Um, you know, many people have asked me if they can join me, and uh, many. I mean, we get a request every other day. Hey, Jaz, you, what's your next step? I'll hold your bags. Can I go with you? Or I'll pay you money. Can I go with you? And I have to be honest. When I am out in the field whether it be in the North Pole, minus 50 degrees, or whether it be in the South of France and it's 70 degrees and it's beautiful. I I, I, I have a tendency, I, I would like to be alone. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that helps me connect to myself and find out who I am. Uh, and I still haven't figured it out. So um, I was going to ask. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what, have you, what have you found out? Uh, yeah, it's a it's a very difficult nut to crack. So I I don't know. Um, so no, the the intention is not for them to go with me. Definitely, uh, you know, the intention is for them to feel happy about it and you know put a smile on their face. And if they have the means and they can buy it for themselves, then you know put it in your house and be happy about it all the time. You look at it. So, so your higher purpose is to create happiness for others. Is is that what it is? I believe so. It it gives me a, a huge pleasure seeing a smile on someone's face, or seeing the awe of "Oh my God, how did he get that?" You know, it it makes me feel great. I'm I'm wondering. So, do you have a a team now that works with you or supports you, or are you more of a um, a loner, like a, I understand that when you're on the trip, you want to be alone. You said that, but do you, do you have a team of people that you work with on your projects? Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, thank God for that. And um, I do have people who I work with, uh, and 
you know, they support me in every single process of photography and marketing and so on and so forth. So right. uh, I, I wouldn't be able to do this by myself. It's impossible. And out of all of this, you know, pursuit of yourself, pursuit of your passion, did you ever have like a specific ambition or goal that, that you wanted to achieve that, that you said to yourself, you know, like five years from now, here's what I'd like to do or what I'd like to achieve? Yeah, maybe that's something that I really sit down. It's funny that you asked me that question because I was just telling someone uh, in my team saying that, you know, I got to sit down and come up with a plan. Um, no, I don't. I mm -hmm. don't. Uh, the goal so far has been that we should be in X amount of galleries and and these galleries should be able to display our work properly. Uh -huh. uh, in the film business, uh, my goal is to make one film per year and, and it should be uh, a theme where we are uh, not just making a film to entertain, but also making a film to to support a cause, so to speak. Like, you know, we did one film that was supporting uh, 300 horses in the United States. And we now just finished another film that is supporting uh, the sex abuse. So uh, it's, I think the theme is to, to keep going with what we do because I love it so much and I don't work a single minute of my day, so. You know, what's the better gift than that? Yeah. No, it's it's very interesting and very inspiring. I'm the reason I'm asking uh, more questions about plans and and also about you know I was it's funny that you just said what were the movies about because I was actually going to go there and and I was going to ask you like it's interesting that the topics of the movies they all tend to be around the cause right like you know saving animals. Um, saving victims of, you know, sexual exploit, or at least opening the eyes of the world that this is actually freaking happening in the United States, out of all places in the world. Um, what does so? So why these causes? Like, what what is this drive to connect to these causes? You think where does that come from? Yeah, it's it's funny. While I'm speaking with you, you are actually uh, teaching me about myself. Um, and I never thought that way. And now since you're speaking to me, I, I think I get my drive, my push comes from the fact when I see someone uh, in a good place, uh, someone happy, someone with a smile. And I think the reason why I choose these topics is because, um, you know, there was an interview, a TV interview in North Dakota, and they were taking my interview, and they said to me, what is the real reason why you're making such a difficult topic of sexual abuse? And, mm -hmm. and I said, well, I, is it money? Is it this? Is it that? And I said, well, you know, if one girl decides not to run away from home, I believe I'll be a successful person. So that was, that's the only intention there in that film. You know, so the next film that we are working on is called Reality, and that film is about mental illness. Uh, and basically what I want to touch upon in, in the newest film, which we're working on, is that, you know, it people do things not intentionally all the time. So they're just forced to do it. And people around them should, when I say forced to do it, I mean you're mentally sick and you cannot help but do what you're doing. And the people around them should be supportive of, you know, people who know that they have, they're suffering from that. So, um, and I think that that will help people. And, you know, once you help people, I think that that makes me happy. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I can completely get it. And I, I sort of feel like, you know, what happened to you took the smile off of your face and then, you sort of went on this journey to go back to the things that you deeply enjoy first, you know, your, your passion. And it, it looks like it, it is putting some kind of a smile on your face, right? Like when you, do, do you ever smile when you take the photos, by the way? I'm just curious. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I talk, I, I speak, I, yeah, I mean, it just, I am, I am who I am the closest to Ijaz when I am on my own uh, in nature. 
So, yeah, I, I speak to myself. I speak to the animals. I speak to anyone who is listening. But the fact is nobody is there. So. <laughs> right. Interesting. Yeah. So, so you speak to yourself. You speak to the animals. And um, do you find that that's your true voice when, when you speak there? Like what you say is different from what you say here? I I definitely feel that because what I say there is not no one's judging me. Mm -hmm. You know, there's only one person who's judging myself. Like, and sometimes I question that too because uh, I'm saying to myself, "You said that the other day, you little dummy. Why did you say that?" <laughs> you know. So other than myself, there's nobody there to judge me. So I say whatever comes to my heart, and uh, uh, it makes me it gives me immense pleasure. Uh you mentioned to me, you know, once when uh, you talked about, I think it was the North Pole, but maybe it was the South Pole that, you know, it was like extremely cold and you almost, you, you had a frostbite and almost lost your your finger. Can you share that story a little bit? Like, why did you go there and what happened? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, why did I go there? I think I went there because I uh, decided that the uh, the Arctic wolf is a very rare animal, and I didn't think that anyone would be able to. Not I'm gonna say at least ninety nine point nine percent of the people will never be able to see an Arctic wolf in person. Um, so I came home one day. I told my wife. I said, "Okay, I'm going to the Arctic," and she smiled and. <laughs> Because you know the 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 trip was not planned with any kind of thought behind it. I didn't know what the temperature was going to be. I had no clue. Um, so I put myself and uh, the people that helped me uh, with my work. I said, "Okay, we're going to research the Arctic, and we are going to find a place to go to." So within a few days, we found a place called Greasefjord, which is the northernmost town in the world, uh, next to Svalbard. But this is in Canada. And um, and then we looked them up, and they had about 130 people who lived in that town, and most of the people were Inuits. So I said, okay, I want to go there. Um, no cause, no reason, other than the fact that I'm going to go there, and then from there, I'm going to chase the Arctic wolf and find the audio world, take pictures, and come back. Uh, show it to people, everybody's going to be happy, and they'll smile. Uh, then we said, how do we find someone over there? Because this is not a tour. It's not a, a destination. So we looked at the yellow pages, and we started calling every single home. There were, if I'm not mistaken, there were about 36 homes, 36 or 40 homes. Mm -hmm. And I remember telling everybody in my team saying, how difficult can it be? Basically 40 calls. You call 40 people, one of them is going to agree to take me. Right. <laughs> and, and it happened that one of them agreed to take me. And uh, so I was going back and forth and he says, when do you want to come? And I said, I want to come and it's really, really cold. He said, okay, then you can come over there. And, you know, here I'm in New York and we get minus 10 degrees thinking I can handle the cold over there. I had no clue. I mean, yes, I had gone to Alaska, but Alaska never hit more than minus 20 when I was there. Um, bottom line, after some time, six, seven months passed, I used to call him every other day to be friends with him. It Time came for me to leave and he turned around and he said to me, I am sickly, and doctors have asked me to go to a surgery, so I cannot do it. Maybe next year, if, you, if I'm okay, next year you can come. So I contacted a person that I knew in Canada who organizes all these uh, trips and stuff for me. And she said, why don't you make some more phone calls? So bottom line, I found this other gentleman by the name of Raymond. Uh, there, were only, there are only three hunters in that community and their job is to basically hunt and bring the meat back uh, so i contacted him he agreed and through the person in canada we organized this trip so now here i am i i'm supposed to go from new york to um ecaluit 
he can do it to resolute, resolute to Greaseo. So, you know, I land up in Ecaluit. From Ecaluit, I went to Resolute. When I reached Resolute, Mickey, I have to tell you, that to me was an eye-opener because there are no trees whatsoever. It literally feels like you landed up in Mars, except instead of orange, it's all white. Mm -hmm. The winds were blowing about 60 miles an hour, 60, 65 miles an hour. I had never, ever seen something like that. And when you land over there, the airport is the size of, you know, maybe five times my kitchen. <laughs> That's how big the airport is. And then you get off and there's only one hotel over there or motel where the the Canadian military was staying and they were with me on the flight. So we get down, we get into this little bus and, and it takes us to, and you cannot, there's nothing, you cannot see the roads, you cannot see anything other than just white, white snow, and that's it. And all of a sudden, I started to get my first panic attack in my entire life. Mm -hmm. I started to sweat. And there's no internet. There's no way to communicate back and forth from home. And I started to sweat. I'm saying to myself, what's going on? I feel funny. So the girl that was next to me, she was a park ranger and she was there to do some work and she saw me and she like, it looks like, you know, you, you, you're becoming a ghost. And I'm like, whoa, that takes a lot. So mm -hmm. she's like, are you okay? And I said, well, I'm not, I feel I'm sweating. I feel like I'm going to throw up. And she like, well, you're getting through a panic attack. Are you here by yourself? And I said, yeah. She said, that's the horrible mistake that you've made. Uh, you should never make this trip by yourself. I said, well, I'm here already. Bottom line, we went to the hotel. She sat down. She spoke to me. She gave me her satellite phone because I was craving speaking to my kids, my wife, mm -hmm. uh, friends, somebody, because there was no internet. You know, all of a sudden you feel secluded. So I called my wife and I spoke to her and I spoke to my younger son and and my younger son gave me the encouragement and he's like, dad, you're the strongest person I know because I was thinking of coming back. I'm like, I'm not going any further. That's it. I was done. And um, so I looked into the to the flights and the next flight back was after a week. <laughs> so I said, it doesn't make sense. If I have to stay here for a week, I might as well take the next flight out, go to Greasefield and carry on with my journey. And my wife and my my wife, my son and my mentor was one of the reasons why I kept that journey. And then the next day I flew to Greasefield. Uh, my tracker picked me up from the airport. You know, he lived literally two minutes away. And then off we went. We went for a 19 hour uh, road, not road, there are no roads, snowmobile trip. Right. And we went for the north. And, uh, you know, that trip really taught me about who I am quite a bit, uh, yet to learn more, but quite a bit because um, my tracker, you know, I was, I was uh, away from there by myself and he was in his uh, uh, tent and it was just days and nights and days and nights of being by yourself with no cellular phone, with no anything, the temperatures are minus 50, 56 degrees. Um, what does it, you know, what do you think is the, the quality that it takes to, to live through something like that? Uh, you know, I, I was supposed to have a 14 day trip, uh -huh. uh, Mickey, and I cut it back to 11 days. Because I'll be honest with you, I didn't have it in me, you know, and that was the fight that was going on within my brain because the first day I got a fox. So I photographed the fox. I was really happy. I said, oh, my God, I'm going to make this into a successful trip. The second day, the third day, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, nothing at all. There are no animals. Nothing is coming. You can hear a raven fly over you. And that is it because then there's pin drop silence the winds are blowing crazy the snow is going nuts and it's like what and 50 it's minus 50 i mean uh, you spit and by the time your spit hits the ground hits the the ground it's turned into an ice bomb you know it's uh, 
so cold and uh, I, I I think the cold the physical was not so tortuous for me mm-hmm. the mental was more challenging the physical was you know you're cold okay you know and and you know that you're going to be cold until you leave this place so you make that up in your mind and and you live with it but the fact that you got to stay by yourself talk to yourself no talking to your family brother sister uncle and wife kids friends that just you know that it, it just changes you um what have you learned about yourself because you said it taught you a lot you know one thing i i one thing i have realized that i used to believe that uh nothing can shake me uh-huh. but i have definitely changed that i had you know uh what you know being by yourself for 11 days it, it shook me tremendously um in finding out who i am why did i do the things that i did and and so on and so forth it's um yeah i've learned more about myself in those 11 days than in the past you know how many years i've been on this earth yeah why is it useful by the way to figure out that there are things that can shake you i'm sorry so so you said you re- learned you know that you're not invincible and things can shake you so i'm i'm just wondering you know why why is that useful to know that to you to figure that out um you know i i was always uh, my son says it really well he says dad you have uh, uh, god syndrome uh god syndrome <laughs> <laughs> right uh so you know i had that of course i had that and now it's become lower because i do know that you know uh, i used to think anything and everything is just you know it's okay we'll do it no big deal and now i give it a little bit more thought you know you you can't just just do things because you want to do things and and yeah i mean you know you start to put it together better you organize yourself better and and you said so so you went out there to photo photograph the um the arctic wolves did you manage to do that at the end um so i i was um I was debating in my mind what and I was making up stories literally I was making up stories in my mind to first of all tell my wife and tell my two boys because I believe I'm only answerable to them um what am I going to say to them dad went to the arctic risked his life which of course changes their lives god forbid if something happens to me and he came back with no photograph So on on day 7 I had had it I said no more <laughs> I cannot handle this but I couldn't come up with a story in my mind to tell my family that this is what happened and I couldn't get the wolf the arctic wolf I couldn't get it and I'm coming up with different kind of stories I'm going to say this and they're going to accept it I'm going to say that and they're going to accept it and then i started to say to myself wait a minute why are you making up stories for them what about yourself don't you want to be honest with yourself like why aren't you staying the entire 14 days and then it came to me that you know the god syndrome i am not as tough as i thought i would be you know so so breaking all those layers down for me was crazy and and then on the 11th day though i was really 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 ashamed of myself I told Ram and I said Ram and let's back it up and we'll go and he's like you still have three more days here I said Ram and I cannot handle this anymore I need to go back and uh, he like sure if that's what you want to do um so so here the story with Ram and is that Ram and never uh he didn't smile a lot mm-hmm. so I used to joke around with him and I used to fool around with him and Raymond would not talk Raymond was very serious you know very serious kind of a person bottom line i am he's in the front i'm in the back in the snowmobile and all of a sudden he stops now this is when we are going back to his place so i could stay at his place for three more days and then take the flight back into new york uh and then he stops and then i pull over next to him and i look at him 
and Raymond has a smile on his face. Wow. <laughs> I can see. And I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, something is not right. <laughs> yeah. Why is Raymond smiling? And then Raymond looks at me and he just points out and there's a small little wolf. I mean, he was so far away. And the minute I saw that wolf, I jumped out of my snowmobile and I had dismantled my cameras and everything. I put all the camera, the lens, the everything put together, I put it on the tripod and I started to film. I mean, I started to shoot and one wolf comes to me, literally came about maybe 20 feet away. And then he runs away. And two minutes later, I saw eight wolves coming to me. So there was one, two, three, four. I mean, they just kept on coming and coming. And I'm shooting and I'm shooting and I'm shooting and I'm shooting. Uh, they came seven feet away from me, literally seven feet away from me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I shoot really low. So I'm really low and Raymond is behind me. And all of a sudden, I got mesmerized by their beauty. I stopped shooting because once they passed the camera, I was only going to get their butts. So once they passed the camera, I, I just stopped and I started to walk towards them. And the minute I did that, the alpha wolf turned around and he put his paws into the ground and his mane stood up. And Raymond turned around and said, Ijaz, move back, I'm going to shoot him. If you don't move back, I'll have to shoot him because he was ready to charge at me. Uh, anyway, so bottom line, I moved back slowly and he walked away. And, and in the 11 days, I shot for no more than seven minutes. That's all I had. The time frame I had was seven minutes to shoot these. And then they left. Um, yeah, they <laughs> the alpha and the alpha female walked over the cloth on top of the hill. They turned around. They gave me a look. I wasn't filming. And then they walked down and that was the end of that. So that was, uh, and then I didn't have to make up any stories. So, I mean, after that, the first thing I did was I ran and I jumped and hugged Raymond, <laughs> who was like, get, get away from me, just get away from me. Uh, bottom line, yeah, so it was it was an experience. I mean, I, I was extremely lucky. I've known photographers that have gone there eight, nine, 10 times and have come back with zero. Very interesting. You know? Yeah, but it's, it is. I, I find it very fascinating because it's like you're describing me an inner strategy, I would call it, which is that, okay, so so when something tough happens to you, you kind of start creating a story. But if the story doesn't resonate with your values in a way, because it doesn't sound authentic, you know, you, you kind of go back, okay, so I don't care about other people's stories. Let's check with my story. Then you admit your kind of limitations and you take a step back. So you don't want it anymore or you don't force it anymore. And then it happens. So, so it's, it's, yeah. it's quite unbelievable. Yeah, it, it, yeah. It, it, it's, it's basically, I mean, I have a tendency of working without my gloves in the snow. And I think that's one of the reasons why today I have no, no nerves left in my fingers, my nose and my cheeks. Um, but the reason why I say this to you is because when I jumped out of the the snowmobile and I started to photograph, I I I, I mean I had no in, I had no clue that this is what would happen to my fingers if I didn't wear my gloves uh, and shoot. Um, and the the thought of not getting the photographs right. That was the killer because for me, if I, I mean, I had to prove to my boys and I, my wife mm -hmm. that I went there for a good reason. Um, yeah. And and, and, and I, I thought it was a gift that was just given to me by, you know, call it superpower, or God, whatever you want to call it. Because if you see in the Arctic, there are no roads. Mm -hmm. You just make your own path and you just keep going. And if we were maybe, uh, you know, 10 degrees on the other side, I would have never seen that wolf. You know, they would have never seen me. Uh, Raymond would have never seen these wolves. I would have never got a chance to photograph them. Literally 10 degrees. Had I stayed for another day, mm -hmm. I wouldn't, I still would have missed them. 
So I think everything happens for a reason. I think, uh, you know, why, why didn't I give up on the seventh day? Why did I give up on the 11th day? I don't know. But I think uh, all I can say is that I, I was put in the situation, so I learned not to lie to my family. <laughs> right. Love it. Yeah, it's 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 very it's a great story. But by, by the way, so if you have no nerves in your nose, as you said, um, does that mean that you don't have you, you've lost your ability to smell, or you can you can still? No, it's it's the skin. So it's I cannot I right. you know I cannot feel I I feel someone hitting me here, but mm -hmm. when you just slightly touch, I cannot feel anything. And the same thing with my fingers when I fingers. rub yeah. it against the surface, I don't yeah. feel it. All right. All right, so so you know th that's kind of a story for me about you know sustaining your energy and focusing on what what you really love, and then eventually kind of it, it really leads you somewhere, and you you also figure out a purpose on the way, as you say. Uh, you know, maybe kind of a, a business seek type question. You know, there are so many people that take photos, right? A lot of photographers. And I recently saw your photos for the first time. And these were the photos of horses that you took and some in the United States um, and some in uh, the south of France. And it was very, very interesting. It's, 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 it's more like it's almost like a painting to me when I, when I look at those photos. Thank you. So, so, so it comes like, you know, there's there's something really signature like that I've not seen on other like, like I look at the photo and for a moment I kind of go, what, what, what am, what am I seeing? Is this a painting? Is this a photo? How, how, did, how did this happen? So that's kind of what I went through in my head. And how did you figure out that this was your style? If, if it is, do you call it your style? You know, it's funny you asked me that question because I had a, a, a uh, a woman from London who called me, and she says to me, uh, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna take only ten minutes of your time. Is that okay?" Uh -huh. I'm like, "Okay, sure." Uh, she's like, "I want to know what's your thought process." I said, "About what?" She said, "About photographing." Uh, I said, "My thought process to make make the subject that I'm photographing the best possible, best looking possible." And she said, that's it. There's no formula to it. I said, no. And then she said, okay, so how, what's your process about selection? And I said, you know, in the old days, I used to spray and pray. But these days, I'm very selective about when I'm pressing the trigger. And I don't get that many. I just get what I really want. And she said, what do you, how do you choose what you like? And I said, it's very simple. I keep looking at them on the computer and hitting next, hitting next, until it hits my heart. And once it hits my heart, that's the image that I pull out. And she says, do you look for something uh, like a certain angle? And I'm like, no, I don't. I look for it to touch my heart. And once it touches my heart, that's what I want. And uh, And then she asked me about how do I retouch? And I said, I don't have a formula. But I retouch until I love it more. So mm -hmm. at the end of the day, no, I don't have a formula. People ask me that question. Do you have a formula? Is there a signature? And my signature to all of this is I must, I must love it. It must open my heart. And once I feel that, then I say, okay, it's good to show it to people. I'm just curious, like, you describe okay it must touch my heart I, I i must feel something do you know where you feel it like literally physically where it is how, how do you know that it touched your heart uh i can't stop looking at it all right i all can't right. stop looking at it i can't stop speaking about it and and you know my family gets the brunt of it because i keep dragging them into it like uh, I tell my wife, come on, come here, come here. You look, look, look what I have. Look what I have. I'm excited like a child. Uh, same thing I do with my two boys and they're sick of dad already doing that. But, you know, I say to them, come on, guys, look at it. Look at it. Tell me what do you think? And, you know, it's just excitement. So, you know, when I say I feel, I just am so excited to, to share this uh, wonder 
to not wonder because I created, but the wonder that the God created about the horse or about the animal to the world. Mm. So if it makes me feel so good, I'm sure it's going to make someone else feel good as well. So is that your purpose to, to share the beauty God created with, with the world? Is that? I, I believe so. Mm. I believe I should bring, I'm capable of, uh not having nerves in my fingers so <laughs> then you know that comes with a responsibility of bringing something back to showing showing it to people you know who cannot do it yeah yeah, yeah. I, i remember you told me it was worth it and you know so so now i kind of get the full picture of why it was worth it because you did bring something back that was so unique that's, that's yeah cool. i mean people look at it and they We, we had a show with the, uh, with the wolf center and we had people literally, I mean, they are already in love with the wolf, you know, and then you show them a life-size image of a Arctic wolf and people were crying. I, I was just, uh, uh, you know, they were crying happy tears. So I was just happy to see them that way. And that just gives me immense uh, strength to keep going and doing more and more of it. Wonderful. Do you, do you have partners on this journey? Um, like, did you establish partnerships with other like-minded people or organizations, or are you pretty much on your own uh, at the moment? Uh, I am a loner. So the only partnership I have is with my two boys and my wife. Other than that, there's none. Hmm. Wow. And, and, and do you kind of consider yourself an activist? With, with all the things that you do? Is that a word or that never crosses your mind? I don't believe that. Uh, you know, I think I have to do a lot more uh, to, to be considered to be an activist. I am just scratching the surface. And final question, you mentioned a mentor. So you said, you know, um, the reason you were able to go through this is because you're wife, your, your kids, your family is with you, and, and they are two partners on the journey. And you mentioned the mentor. Anything that we can know about you know, the mentor and what that means to you? Yes. Uh, so my mentor was, is my teacher. Uh, he was my professor. I, when, I, when I first came to America, um, I think two years later or three years later, I got into the clothing business and And I was working for a company and I said, if I want to get better at clothing, I must go to school. So I went to FIT. And uh, that's where I met uh, Michael. Uh, he, his full name is Michael Renzulli. And you must have, when you came to the show, he, I'm sure he was there. You must have met him. I think you did. I think you did. I'm not sure. But Michael was my professor. I was his worst uh, student. Uh, I, I tortured him. But today he's my mentor. He is a part of our family, my kids and my wife and everybody. You know, we all know him. We all speak to him on a daily basis and so on. Uh, he's today, he's, I believe he's 79 or 80 years old. Um, and he's a big part of my life and of our lives. And he, he's, uh, you know, he's someone I look up to. Right. Yeah. I think I met him. I, wasn't he serving wine in, 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 in the gallery? <laughs> <laughs> yes right. yeah he, yeah. he wanted to do something he wanted to be helpful he's like he just what can i do i said so why do everybody yeah 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 Not, beautiful man uh, and like his spirit was definitely coming through you know what he was doing well ages you know it's been fascinating and 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 fun if um you know if we want to end here um What's a piece of advice that you want to give to, you know, today I feel like, you know, let's give an advice to people who are kind of in their middle of the mid middle of uh, life, you know, like 40, 50, and, and, and they're kind of wondering, okay, I have achieved something and, you know, I have this, I have that, but what's next? Well, what would be a piece of advice from you? Yeah, I don't think I'm capable of uh, of advising people. Um, but if there's something I may say is don't look at failure as a negative. You know, it's never negative. 
Yeah. It's never negative. Failure is always good. Learn from it. Amen. I agree. Well, thank you for sharing your thoughts and your life story. And if people want to kind of learn more about you, maybe you can just share your um, um, website. Um, sure. Yeah. Definitely. Great, great. So, you know, either you can say it now or I can I can say it if you want. Oh. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, people should go to uh, ejaz, e -J -A -Z -K -H -A -N photography.com and uh, you can see our work there. You can send me an email. I believe my phone number is there. Send me a text or, you know, whatever you need. Great. So so that's the main place to, to get in touch with you. Yeah. Thank, thanks, all, thanks for sharing and thanks for being here and have... Not at all. You know, ha have lots of energy and, and 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 courage and resilience as as you do clearly to to complete the journey. Thank you. Thank you so much again for listening to the show. I hope you had a good time and you come back to us. Please don't forget to subscribe and don't forget to give us a good rating. If you're interested in some individual coaching, check out www.mantorshift.com mentorshift and also don't forget to get your mindset map at www.mindsetmaps.com so that's www.mindsetmaps.com and I hope to connect with you virtually pretty soon again. Bye for now.